Twelve Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas by Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Prefatory In offering this book to the public, I have not undertaken to present a history of my life. I do not consider my life of enough importance to warrant making a book about it. What I have undertaken to do is to tell some of the exciting experiences that have fallen to the lot of that noble band, the Texas Ranger Force, of which I had the honor to be a member for twelve years. I had the leading part, it is true, in the incidents related, but the reader will see that I was not the whole show. There were others. I have prefixed some brief notes concerning my ancestry and some incidents of my youth, and have followed with true accounts, written in my own plain way, of the principal events of my career as a sergeant of the rangers. I have introduced plates herein, made from photographs, showing the faces of some of the most noted criminals in the annals of Texas, also photo illustrations of some of my dear comrades, all of them, in fact, that I could procure for this edition of my book. In a future edition, I will probably be able to add the likenesses of others. For valuable assistance in the preparation of these pages, I am indebted to numerous friends, who I will not enumerate by name, but whose kindness will ever be remembered by me. I solicit their continued help, and will appreciate suggestions that may be made by these and other friends, and patriotic Texans in general, for use in a contemplated future edition of this work. With a respectful bow to my audience, the public, and a plea for their indulgence instead of their exacting criticism, I am very cordially, the author, W. J. L. Sullivan. Errata. Page 7 and 9, third line from bottom of first paragraph, should read, quote, when I heard him make this remark, quote, instead of, quote, when I made him make this remark, unquote. Page 110, seventh line on the page, should read, quote, just after we entered the house, quote, instead of, quote, just before we entered the house, unquote. My Ancestry My father, Tom Sullivan, was born and raised at number 99 Broome Street, New York City, where he engaged in business as a master mechanic. My grandfather, John Sullivan, was born in Ireland. He and my grandmother moved to New York City and settled on Broome Street, where my father, who was an only child, was born. My grandfather was a mason by order and also by occupation. Just before my father's death, my grandfather wrote him that he was coming to him to bring him $1,500 that he had collected from the rents of my father's property, which was in the city of New York. He started out with the money, as he said he would, and has never been heard of up to seven years ago, when a bank book of his was found in a savings bank in New York. My father went to Perry County, Alabama, and met and married my mother, Summer McFarland, and they moved to Winston County, Mississippi where my father engaged in farming until his death. End of Prefatory Twelve Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas by Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please contact LibriVox.org. Twelve Years in the Saddle, Chapters 1 through 9. Chapter 1 A Runaway. I was born in Winston County, Mississippi, on the 10th day of July in 1851. My father had died 79 days before my birth, leaving my mother with three other children besides me. Later on, my mother married a Mr. Presley of Leak County and two children were born to them. My stepfather moved with us to Bradley County, Arkansas, where my mother died when I was but eight years of age. My stepfather married again. That left me, as it proved to be, in a bad predicament. I had no father nor mother, and my stepfather, after my mother's death, had married another woman. My only sister also married, and soon after that my brother, Tom, died, which left my older brother, Jim, and me, to take care of ourselves as best we could. 
Our troubles had only begun, however, for in 1861 the Civil War broke out, and my stepfather, Mr. Presley, and my brother-in-law went to the front, where both were killed, fighting for the cause of the Confederacy. When Presley went to the war, he left Jim and me with his father-in-law, a Mr. Jeems. It was a cruel fate for us to meet. Old Man Jeems, as he was commonly called, was very hard on Jim and me. A merciless tyrant, with no feeling or principle, he beat us many times until we were so stunned and stupefied that we could not realize whether we were dead or alive. It is a terrible thing for poor, little, innocent children to fall into the tight, greedy clutches of such a man as this. James was known all over that section of the country as a hard character, and the soldiers stationed in that vicinity learned how brutal he was to my brother and me, and paid him a visit one night, about two o'clock, to adjust matters with him with the aid of a new rope, which one of the men carried for convenience on the horn of his saddle. There were about twenty-five in the party, and they called James out to the gate for an interview. One man in the squad, a Mr. Bloxham, had a greater grudge than the others against James, for the latter had stolen a fine milk cow from Bloxham's widowed daughter, of which fact Bloxham had informed the others of the party. After getting James out of the house, they asked him where the two little boys were who lived with him. James answered that they were in bed. They then told him to rouse us and bring us to the gate, which he promptly did. They asked us if we were living with old man Jonathan James. We told them that we were. Then they asked us if our stepfather and brother-in-law were not fighting in the war. We answered that they were. The soldiers then asked us if it was not true that James beat and abused us a great deal. They immediately followed that question up with other inquiries as to the manner in which we were generally mistreated by our stepfather's father-in-law. Brother Jim was afraid to tell them the truth, for fear his guardian would make it all the harder for him in the future. So he denied that he was mistreated, and said that James was good to us. I spoke up when Jim got through, and told the soldiers that my brother was afraid to tell the truth, that James whipped and abused us all the time, and that occasionally he would beat us nearly to death. Jim contradicted the things that I told them, but the soldiers said that if his story had corroborated mine, they would break Jim's neck right there with their rope. This talk, however, frightened Jim all the more, and when they asked him again if old James wasn't making slaves of us, he vigorously denied it. They asked Jim if James had stolen the cow that belonged to Bloxham's daughter, but Jim got further from the truth than ever, and denied that too. I knew that James had stolen the cow, and killed her for beef, and I told the soldiers that. But the statements that Jim and I had made were conflicting, and the soldiers would not hang him. They still believed James to be guilty, however, and lectured him about an hour and a half before they let him go to bed. They told him they would watch him after that, and see that he conducted himself properly, as long as he lived in that community. Jim and I went back to bed but could sleep no more the rest of the night for thinking over this exciting episode. If Jim had not been so frightened, and had borne me out in my statements, the soldiers would have hung James, and from that hour we would have been entirely and forever free from that heartless tyrant. But, as it was, we lay in our bed the remainder of that eventful night, debating, in whispers, as to whether the soldier's visit, since it resulted as it did, would make our life more pleasant or more miserable. Since James had heard what I had to say to the soldiers, and since he was permitted to live on guard over me, I decided that he was going to make things even more disagreeable for me, if possible, than ever before. So I told my brother that I was going to make my escape the next day, if I got a chance. I knew that the sooner I got off, the better. So at twelve o'clock I bade my brother goodbye, climbed over the fence behind the barn, and hit the trail like a deer. I ran as swiftly as my legs could carry me, and jumped over logs and bushes to save the time it would take to go around them. A few times I looked back just long enough to see if I was being pursued, and then I would run faster than ever on my way to Mr. Bloxham, the man whose daughter's cow was stolen by James. I enjoyed the prospects of getting out of James' reach. If I had not run away from him, he would have made a shipwreck of me for telling the soldiers about his lawlessness. Soon I, myself, was to be with those soldiers and to have their protection and I was glad. When I reached Bloxham's home, he saluted me, and told me that I had done right, and asked me where my brother was. I told him that he was still in James's hands. 
Bloxham then took occasion to remark that James would have been a dead man if my brother's story had not conflicted with the statements which I had made the night before. I asked Mr. Bloxham if he thought I could stay with the soldiers. He assured me that I could, and got his son, Tom, to saddle his horse and take me over to Carter's regiment. I rode behind Tom, and we reached the soldiers' camp some time after dark. James guessed that I had gone to Bloxham's and put my brother on a mule and sent him over there in search of me. Bloxham advised him to join me and stay with the army. Jim told him that he couldn't do that, as he had the old man's mule, and that he had to go back on that account. Bloxham sent the mule back to James by a soldier, and someone conducted Jim to the regiment where I had gone, he reaching camp an hour or two after I did. Jim was afraid to run away, but felt mightily relieved when the soldiers took us with them and gave us their protection. Chapter 2 Better Days Never shall I forget the night the brother and I reached the soldiers' camp when we first joined Carter's regiment. Everything seemed very different from what we were used to, but we felt easier and more comfortable. We were not afraid that we would be jerked up at any moment and cuffed about and abused, as was Jim's manner of treating us. The soldiers felt sorry for Jim and me and treated us as kindly as they could. Colonel Giddings had charge of this regiment, and knowing the plight we were in told us that we could stay with his men as long as we wished. We were too young to fight, but we began to feel as if we was real soldiers. Once, while we were with the regiment, the soldiers captured, somewhere on the Arkansas River, 400 mules, 125 or 30 wagons, and several Yankees. At another place, we captured about 300 beeves. We had been with the regiment about 15 months, when three of the soldiers, uh, Trey of Burton, Bill Henley, and Leonard Burns, got furloughs to go home. Well, this was about two months before the close of the war. The three men asked Brother Jim and me to go home with them. We accepted their kind invitation, and with them left the army. For a little while, I lived with Leonard Burns, and James stayed with Trey Burton. Later on, however, we got together, and both of us lived with Mr. and Mrs. Bill Henley, with whom we stayed for a number of years, not leaving them until we were about grown. Mr. and Mrs. Henley were like father and mother to James and me. I never knew before what it was to be in such a good home. It seemed a paradise to me, who had been left an orphan boy, unprotected, and at the mercy of rough, careless, unfailing people, and I could well appreciate my new surroundings. It is sad for little children to be left without a father and mother to take care of them, and when poor, little orphans endure what James and I had to bear, they should be very thankful when they are placed in a good home, as we were. God pity the orphan children of this world, and may he bless the kind-hearted people who take them in and raise them to become useful men and women. Mr. and Mrs. Henley always taught and encouraged us to be honest and industrious, and to have a proper regard for the law. Through respect for their memory, and because I owed it to myself and to my own father and mother who died in my infancy, I always lived up to those teachings. Since I have served the people of Texas as a ranger and dealt with numerous criminals, I have learned through personal observation the wisdom of the teachings of those good old people. The world is full of tragedies, and having been a state officer for over twelve years, I have witnessed many of them myself. Many criminals have brought shame, misery, and trouble upon themselves, their families, and their friends, because they started out in their youth with no respect for the laws of God and man. In the following chapters, I shall tell you the tragic story of dozens of criminals who wound up their careers in the penitentiary, or, in a few instances, at the rope's end. In some cases, the men had no parents, while children, to care for them, nor anyone else to teach them how to become honest, upright, and useful. In other cases, however, they were men who had parents, but, while young and smart, they had disregarded the teachings of their elders, and later on, had flagrantly violated the laws of their country, until they were finally locked within the four walls of a penitentiary, their liberty gone, and themselves disgraced and despised. They are left in dark, lonely cells to brood day and night over their unhappy fate, and to realize the folly of their former misbehavior. I have encountered many men who appeared, at first sight, to be good, but who were really tough characters, and who, unfortunately, possessed much influence for evil over their companions. Thus, young people should be very careful with whom they associate. 
I have also seen men in good circumstances disobey the law for some material acquisition, and lose whatever they had thereby gained, together with all they ever possessed before, trying to stave off the prosecution, and they were fortunate, even at that, if they are not finally sent to the penitentiary. With these impressive lessons before me, and because I ever wanted to do my duty and be honest, thereby gaining my own self-respect, I always tried to do what I thought was right, and I respected and obeyed the laws of my country. Once or twice, when I was young, I laid wagers with money, and several times I drank whiskey, but I soon saw the folly in these, the only vicious habits that I ever started, and nipped them in the bud. For twelve years, my business took me into the worst saloons, gambling dens, and low dives in Texas, but I always managed to keep from falling into the habits of the people whom I encountered in these places. I am getting old now, and as people usually do in their declining years, I spend many of my idle hours in meditation, thinking ever of the incidents of my past life, and while thus reviewing my record as an officer and an honest citizen, I am rewarded with the only genuine happiness and satisfaction that man can experience while, with tottering footsteps, he is near in the gateway through which he passes into the unknown world beyond. Chapter 3 An Indian Raid In 1871, I joined a party of cattlemen who were on their way to Ellsworth, Kansas, to which place they were driving 3,000 head of cattle which belonged to Tom Pullman and a Mr. Matthews. These two gentlemen owned three more herds of beeves, with about 3,000 head to a herd. We were traveling on the Tom Chisholm Trail, which led to Smoky River. This was in the early days, before there were any railroads to amount to anything in Texas, and cattle had to be driven all the way to Kansas across country. The Tom Chisholm Trail was always lined all the way from Texas to Kansas. It was a great sight to see so many cattle driven on this trail, all bound for the same market. One could look forward or backward and not be able to see the end of the long string of cattle. I was just a young man then, and went along to help drive this herd of cattle to market. I enjoyed the trip very much, as the scenery was beautiful, and camping out was delightful for us cowboys. The grass all along the route was as fine as it could be, and kept the cattle reasonably fat, considering the long journey, and when they reached their destination, it would only take a few days' rest to get them in perfect condition. Those were great days in Texas, when money was plentiful and wages good. We received splendid pay for driving cattle, and the work was most enjoyable. Game was plentiful all the way from Texas to Kansas. The country was full of elk, buffalo, antelope, and deer, and we always had plenty of venison to eat, after our appetites were sharpened from a day's riding in the saddle. We had our cattle bedded near the Canadian River one rainy night, and Tom Murphy of Austin and I were guarding them. At twelve o'clock that night, about fifteen Indians made a sudden raid on the cattle and stampeded them. The cattle and horses were very much frightened and scattered in every direction. All the cowboys came to our rescue. The first dash the Indians made, they cut off about seventy-five cattle from the herd. The other cattle then ran about two miles and a half in a circle before they broke the mill. I was on my saddle when the Indians made the raid, but I was not. My horse, however, instantly realized the situation and made a spring forward, throwing me behind the saddle before I roused myself sufficiently to know what the trouble was. It happened, however, that I succeeded in grabbing the horn of my saddle, and I finally managed to regain my proper position. It was impossible to control the cattle, as the Indians had so badly frightened them. All of them got away from us that night except fifty head, and it took us two weeks to gather them all up as they scattered for miles over the country. When we got them rounded up, we took them on to Kansas without further trouble and sold them. The Indians captured in their raid on our herd about 100 head of cattle in all, and I imagine they had quite a feast. While I was in Quana in 1896, helping to hold court in the George Isaacs case, 400 beef steers were brought into town one day from the Spur Ranch. Eighteen cowboys came in with the cattle, and before they left town, one of them stole a suit of clothes and a gold watch from a Mr. Greathouse, a merchant of Kana. Bob Dawson came to me while I was in court, helping to guard Isaacs, and told me that he wanted me to assist them in running down the thief. Well, I told him that I would, so we got our horses and started out after the cowboys. We followed them fifteen miles to a place where they had stopped for dinner, and we arrested them and told them that we wanted to search the whole outfit for the clothes and watch. They said, all right, 
and we made the search and found the stolen articles, so we took the boss out and told him that he had better advise the guilty party to own up, or we would have to take the whole bunch back to town. He failed to get a confession from any of them, so we arrested the whole bunch, boss and all, and escorted them to Kana. In the party there was one man, who weighed around 260 pounds, who kept edging around me, trying to get hold of my six-shooter, but I stood him off, and we made him hitch up the wagon and take the others back to Canada. They had a hundred head of cow ponies, and they took them back with them. When we marched into Canada with the men and ponies, everybody yelled out, Yonder comes Coxey's army. About dark, one of the men, by the name of Sloan, pled guilty. His brother had begged him to confess, which he did. He was lodged in the Canada jail, and was charged with stealing enough property to land him in the penitentiary, but the state made it a finable offense, and his companions paid it out, and they left together for their ranch, a happy set of cowboys. Chapter 5. Ben Hughes While trying to capture Ben Hughes, who was wanted for train robber in the Indian Territory, the officers had a fierce battle with him, during which Deputy Sheriff Whitehead, who was a Cherokee Indian, was killed. Hughes was tried for this, but was acquitted, as the killing occurred at night, and no one saw him shoot Whitehead, and it could not be proven that he was responsible for the officer's death. I carried Ben Hughes' wife from the Union Depot in Fort Worth to the Windsor Hotel, with instructions from Grude Britton, who was sergeant at that time, to make a thorough search for money. Mrs. Windsor, the proprietress of the hotel, assisted me in making the search on Mrs. Hughes' person for the money which we thought her husband had gotten and turned over to her. I got Mrs. Windsor to help me in searching the woman, because I felt a delicacy in making a search on the person of a lady. I had the respect for her that any gentleman should have for a lady, even if I was searching her for stolen money. I only found about twelve or fifteen dollars on her, and she said that was her own money, and so I let her keep it. Mrs. Hughes looked to be about twenty-five years of age. Sam Farmer and Sergeant J. M. Britton took Hughes to Dallas and placed him in jail, and Mrs. Hughes left that evening for Palo Pinto County. Chapter 6. A Buffalo Hunt A. Ann Waldrop, Bob Gunn, and I left Logan's Gap, Comanche County, February 1877, for Tom Green County on a big buffalo hunt, intended to make Jim Kreiner's ranch our headquarters. Kreiner was a brother-in-law of Bob Gunn. After reaching Tom Green County, I saw about a mile ahead of me a bunch of buffalo, and remarked to one of the boys that I was going to rope one of them. I dismounted, tightened my saddle girths, and mounted again and made for the bunch of buffalo. They were traveling east. The morning was very cold, as the wind was blowing from the east. As soon as they discovered me, they started in a run for their life. There were about 150 in the bunch. I ran on to a three-year-old bull, through malaria, but it failed to catch, as I was throwing against the wind, which was very high. The second throw, I put him into my loop. The high, fast bucking and pulling came off then and there. Birch, my horse, was not thoroughly trained, and didn't like the scent of buffalo at all. I had a hard time controlling him with this raging, rearing beast tied to the horn of my saddle, as this was about the first bunch of buffalo Birch had ever seen, and the only one he had ever been tied to. Birch and I were like the man that bought the elephant, and didn't hardly know what to do with him. I made two runs around the buffalo, and got his legs tangled in my lariat. I then made a straight run on him, busting him against the ground. When he got up, he discovered our horses and wagons, and took the outfit for his brother bunch of buffalo. He then made a run for horses and wagon, and when we got to the wagon, I decided to take him to Jim Kreiner's ranch, which was about ten or twelve miles distant, and neck him to a steer. I tied him to the hind axle of the wagon, and he led as docile as any horse for about three hundred yards, and all at once he took a notion to stop, and the horses pulling the wagon took a notion to stop also. We started the horses up again, and they kept pulling until they led him over, at the same time jerking his right shoulder out of place. I had him to kill then, and lost my buffalo. This was a grand old hunt, and proved very profitable to us. The buffalo in that country were as thick as cattle, and went from three to ten thousand in a bunch. There were also thousands of antelope, and wild turkeys were so thick that they would hardly get out of one's way. Chapter 7. A Stolen Herd 
I was employed in 1877 by Bill Yoakum, a cattleman, to help him drive a herd of 300 cattle from his place in Comanche County to Clear Fork on the Brazos River. While in his service, Yoakum told me that he and Jim Gregg, who was Yoakum's partner for several years, had stolen these cattle and burnt the brands out and put on another brand. He told me that he had stolen the cattle out of Tarrant, Johnson, Collins, and other counties, and that he never took over five head out of the same range. He also said that he had made it a rule to steal only from men who were not able to prosecute him heavily if he was caught. One day Yoakum asked me to join him, saying that we would make a fortune stealing cattle, but I told him that I would let him know about it later on. Near Yoakum's place lived a Mrs. Holt, a widow, who had bought a milk cow from Yoakum, paying him a good price for it. Yoakum laughingly remarked to me one day that he had stolen the cow which he had sold to Mrs. Holt from her range, and that she didn't know the difference. I said to myself, oh, you two dirty thieves, uh, meaning Yoakum and his partner Greg, if I can catch you, I certainly will do so. After that, I kept my eyes open and watched Yoakum very closely. Whenever I managed to get off to myself, I walked around the herd and took down the brands of these 300 cattle that had been stolen from different parties throughout the state. After procuring sufficient evidence to show that they had stolen the cattle, I went to Brackenridge and informed the sheriff of these facts and he and I went to the office of the Justice of the Peace, where I swore out warrants for the arrest of Yoakum and Gregg. The sheriff sent his deputy, Frank Freeman, with me to make the arrest, and we reached the herd late in the evening. Gregg was with the herd, grazing cattle in a mesquite flat, when we found him, and arrested him first. Turning my head toward the wagon, I saw Mrs. Yoakum standing on the wagon tongue, motioning her husband to run, which he did. Freeman and I immediately placed Greg in the charge of other officers who would come along, and set out in pursuit of Yoakum. Yoakum was riding a fast saddle mule, but was caught by Freeman and I, and we brought him back to where the other men were. While the deputy sheriff was reading the warrant to Yoakum, the latter, being angered at me, suddenly made a play for his six-shooter to kill me, but I was too quick for him, and blocked his game. Several men who watched us arrest Yoakum and Greg were in sympathy with them, and claimed that Yoakum did not try to draw a gun on me. The deputy sheriff, being busy reading the warrant, did not see Yoakum's movements, so he could not say whether I was right or wrong in attacking Yoakum. Old Man Wilson, uh, W.R., seemed to be the worst stuck on Yoakum, and I thought for quite a while that I would have him to kill, but he eventually quieted down. I ate no supper that night, nor breakfast the next morning, and drank nothing but a little water out of a creek. The following morning, we started back to Brackenridge, taking our two prisoners to jail. Mrs. Yoakum accompanied us to town. When we reached the town, Old Man Wilson, the great friend of Yoakum, swore out a warrant for me, charging me with assault upon Yoakum. They wanted to arrange it so that I couldn't be in Brownwood to appear against Yoakum when the trial came off, but Freeman held himself responsible for me, and in that way blocked their game. We left the next morning for Brownwood. Frank Freeman and I rode along together, and while discussing various subjects to pass away the time, we accidentally learned that we were distant relatives. And that probably accounts for Frank being so nice to me, and afterward showing me so many favors. While we were in Brackenridge, Yoakum and Greg employed Attorney Webb to defend them. That night, when we reached camp, Yoakum asked the deputy sheriff if he could talk to me, and, being told that he could, he took me off a few yards to make me a proposition. He told me that if I would not appear against him, he would go to Brownwood and beat that one case and leave the country with his stock. I cannot afford to do it, I said, for such characters as you should be in the penitentiary. He then went back to the wagon, and Freeman called me off and asked me what Yoakum had told me, and I repeated the proposition that Yoakum had made to me. Those men who went out to help arrest Yoakum and Greg are undoubtedly thieves and thugs themselves from the way they worked against you, said Frank, and it might be best for you not to go back to Brackenridge, for you will be alone up there, since no one knows you except me, and those tough characters might kill you. I know them too well, he continued, and I am satisfied that Yoakum made a break for his gun, but his friends will swear that he didn't, and that will cause lots of trouble. Frank then told me that he being responsible for me, he could manage it for me if I wanted to get loose. I told him that I thought it best for me to leave and not go back to Brackenridge, so I left that night from my former home. 
Yoakum succeeded in beating his case through a slick scheme of his attorney. Webb and his clients worked on Mrs. Holt and won her over to their side. Yoakum brought Mrs. Holt's cow back, and Mrs. Holt swore in court that that was not her cow, and the indictments were quashed. I learned afterward that Mrs. Holt went over to Brownwood in the wagon with Mrs. Yoakum, and it nearly made me lose confidence in the fair sex. In accordance with his promise to me, Frank Freeman advertised the brands of the stolen cattle, and cattlemen came from several parts of the state and claimed their property. If I had been easily persuaded, as a great many young, unfortunate boys are, to join those cattle thieves in the theft of cattle, I would, most likely, have been found later hanging at the end of a rope, or serving a long sentence in the penitentiary. Chapter 8. The Hanging of Bill Longley On the 11th of October, 1879, I witnessed the execution of Bill Longley, who was hung at Giddings, Lee County, for the murder of Wilson Anderson. The sheriff, Jim Brown, who had charge of the execution, was the noted horse racer who was afterward killed in Chicago by a policeman. A little while before the execution, the sheriff read the death sentence to Bill, and, pointing to his two hundred guards, he told the people that he had worked three months selecting his men for the occasion, and that he thought he had about the best there was in the country to assist him in the execution. He then asked Bill if he wanted to make a talk. Bill said he did, and pulled his hat off and placed it in a chair. Then, looking calmly over the crowd, he addressed the guards and spectators as follows. Well, this is a big crowd to witness the last of me. I know I am surrounded by enemies, but I forgive them for all that they have done against me, and I want them, as well as my friends, to pray for me. And then, continuing, he said, I understand that my brother, Jim, was in here to kill the man who cuts the rope to hang me. If you are in this crowd, Jim, don't kill anybody on my account. I knew that if I was ever caught, I would have to pay the penalty which I am now paying. I hate to die, but I have killed many a man who hated to die as mad as I do now, so I know I am getting my just desserts. When Bill finished his harangue, he knelt between two priests. He had been confined in the jail at Galveston for eighteen months, and while there he had become a Catholic. Each priest put his hand on the man's head, and they knelt together in prayer for several minutes. When he arose, he walked straight to the trap door, and, bowing to the crowd, said, Goodbye to everybody. The sheriff immediately placed the cap over his head, the rope around his neck, and bound his hands and feet. Then he got the hatchet and cut the rope. The trap door swung back, Bill fell through, and his neck was broken. Mrs. Anderson, the widow of the man whom Longley had murdered, was present at the execution with her two children. When the doctors pronounced Bill to be dead, she remarked that she was satisfied. Then they let him down and placed him in his coffin. The rope was coiled and laid on his breast, and the lid of the coffin screwed securely on. A sorrowful father then took charge of the remains of his former wayward son. Bill's cousins had given him a nice suit, and he was neatly dressed. Young and fine-looking, with dark hair and long black mustache, and with a complexion as fair as a lady's, he looked so handsome before his death that it seemed a pity for him to die in such a terrible and unnatural manner. Chapter 9. The Capture of Henry Carruthers In 1879, John Presall, a Pinkerton detective, told me that he had traced Henry Carruthers to the San Bernard River, and that he wanted me and several others to help capture him. Carruthers is the man who killed a Mr. Kirk, a prominent man of McDade. With Willis McMarron and Albert Rosenberg, I immediately left Burton, on my way to join Presall. We traveled all Saturday night, and reached the San Bernard River at daybreak on Sunday morning. There we met Presall, who had summoned us, and Sheriff Lewis of Austin County, Charlie Langhammer, John Collar, Bob Flack, Fritz Rosenberg, and John Rankin. We all started out immediately in search of Henry Carruthers. Prisall had learned that he was hunting on the San Bernard River. Late that evening, we learned from two Swede boys where Carruthers' camp was located. We immediately struck out for the place, but when we reached the camp, we found no one in it, although we saw signs which indicated that some parties had left only a little while before. We lit on their trail and loped our horses nine miles through a country full of nothing but post oaks and rocks. About half a mile from the little town of New Ulm, John Presall said that he and Sheriff Lewis and Charlie Langhammer would go ahead, 
and for us six men to stay about a quarter of a mile in the rear. A little while after the three men left us, we saw, about a quarter of a mile down the road, a wagon with some men in it. Willis McMarron and I had ridden about two hundred yards ahead of the other four, much to their chagrin, and when Presall, Lewis, and Langhammer passed the wagon, they discovered that Henry Carruthers and his father and two others were in it. When they passed them, the officers heard old man Carruthers say, in a low tone to his son, Henry, you know what you have always said. The officers then looked back, and, seeing Henry Carruthers and his father reaching for their guns, quickly dropped off their horses. Henry Carruthers leaped out with his Winchester and stationed himself behind the rear part of the wagon. His father took a shotgun and jumped over into a field to get behind a fence. When McMarron and I saw these movements, we knew that that was Henry Carruthers and his father, so we laid steel to our horses and rode quickly to the rescue of the three officers in front of us. Two of the men whom we had left behind, John Collar and John Rankin, tore down the fence and rode into the field where old man Carruthers had stationed himself. When the old man saw us surrounding them, he called out to his son to fire on the front men. Tom Gentry, a friend of the two Carruthers, and a yellow negro, whose name was Guiche, were in the wagon. Guiche had always promised Mars Henry that if the officers ever attacked them, he would certainly stay and fight until he was killed. When Henry and his father showed fight, Guiche at once left the wagon as if he had wings. He jumped over the fence into the field, and for a mile and a half he could not be seen for cotton flying thick around him as he was leaving Marza Henry. This affair happened about six o'clock in the evening, and the Negro ran all the way to Burton, a distance of thirty-five miles, reaching his home at four o'clock the next morning. Tom Gentry crawled through the fence and went to Mr. Carruthers and pled with him not to advise his son to fight, saying that neither one of them had any chance for their lives. The old man paid no attention to him, however, but called out again to his son to fire on the front men. "'You and I are good for two men apiece,' he told Henry, "'and it will never do for you to surrender.' Henry then laid his Winchester down and picked up Gentry's shotgun and told Gentry that he was going to initiate his gun by using it first. Gentry then told Henry, For God's sake, do not fight when you have no chance on earth to win. Henry then recognized Charlie Langhammer, the officer in front who used to be sheriff of Austin County, and who tried hard to capture him when he first committed the terrible murder. Henry had always had it in for Charlie, so he invited him to come out from behind his horse, and they would take a few shots at each other. Charlie started out, but Sheriff Lewis called him back and told Henry that if he challenged anyone else to fight him, he would order his men to fire on him immediately. Henry then asked Lewis how many men he had with him. Lewis replied that he had nine, and they were all officers. He then asked Lewis if any of the bells were along. Lewis answered that they were not. The bells were kin to Kirk, the murdered man, and Henry dreaded them. Lewis then told him that if he surrendered, the officers would protect him, and that he would not be hurt. Finally, Henry turned to his father and said, I have a wife and two children, and you have a wife and six children to live for, and if we both get killed in this fight, they will be left without protection. So if you will keep out of this fight and let me make it myself, I will not give up, but if you don't let me fight it out myself, I will surrender. The old man would not consent to surrender, and said that he wanted to fight it out, whereupon Henry laid his Winchester down, climbed into the wagon, and standing on the seat, said, Gentlemen, I have surrendered. We had a bench warrant for him from the governor, so we handcuffed him and shackled him on his horse, which we had procured at New Elm. Bob Flack and John Rankin took turns about leading the horse on which the prisoner was mounted, but Henry cursed and abused them so that they tried to shove the job off on me, but I didn't take it, as I did not relish being abused any more than they did. I told Henry it wouldn't help his case a bit for him to abuse the officers, but it seemed to afford him pleasure and consolation and he kept on cursing everybody around him. He told Bob Flack he would give him a thousand dollars if he would arrange it so he could make his escape. Bob refused the offer, of course, and Henry asked him how many men it would require to take him away from the officers. Bob told him that he could not be taken, that they would all die before they would give him up. Henry then informed us that if his brother-in-law, John Williams, happened to find out that he was captured, that he would gather a band of men and take him from the officers and set him free. At midnight, as we were entering a long lane, we heard a signal at our left on the prairie, and Henry said that that must be Williams and his men. 
As soon as we heard the signal, the advance guard saw a light further up the lane. I was then leading Henry's horse, and Prezal, the detective, who was at my side, gave me instructions to shoot Henry and cut his horse's rope from my saddle if William's men should try to take him away from us. Prezal then said that we would all try to win the fight if we were to have an encounter with Williams and his men, so all of us prepared ourselves for any emergency that might occur. Turning to Henry, I said, If this is Williams and his bunch, it will go awful hard with you. I think Henry heard Prezal's instructions, for he seemed rather frightened, and believing strongly that it was Williams and his men up the lane, he called out to Williams, but received no answer. We held up, and sent the advance guard forward to see who those men were whom we had heard. They came back in a little while and reported that they were a band of cattlemen, and that the signal which we heard to our left came from the cowboys at the herd. We then resumed our journey, and when we passed these supposed cattlemen, they lined up on the right side of the lane and held their six-shooters and Winchesters ready for action. I am satisfied that they were a bunch of thieves expecting to be taken by the officers, or they would not have been so well prepared to fight as they were. We reached Round Top at daybreak, and placed Henry in the calaboose, and put two men to guard him. Then we slept until breakfast at John Rankin's house. When we put Henry in the calaboose, we shackled him securely, as we knew he would make his escape if he had half a chance, for he was in a desperate mood, and was a shrewd and daring man. The shackles, which we put on him, were fastened underneath the floor to a sleeper, and were not movable. He filled the keyholes of his shackles with small shot, in order to give us all the trouble he possibly could, and when we transferred him, we were detained a long time getting the shot out of the keyholes. We took him to LaGrange. He was tried later on at Bastrop, and given a sentence of life imprisonment in the penitentiary, but was pardoned out by the governor after he had served six years of his term. I met him after he was given his freedom, and he was very friendly with me and, as he was making a splendid citizen, I welcomed his friendship, and told him I was glad to see him a free man, and doing well. And chapters 1 through 9 Twelve years in the saddle for law and order on the frontiers of Texas By Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Chapters 10 through 17. Chapter 10 An Exciting Fisticuff. Colonel R. D. Hunter wrote to Captain S. A. McMurray of our company asking him to let me have a leave of absence to go to Thurber to attend to some anarchists and dynamiters who were giving the officials a lot of trouble at the mine. He said, in his letter to Captain McMurray, that he would give me a hundred dollars a month to act as an officer for the company and rid the mine of these characters. The captain showed me the letter and asked me if I thought I could do the work. I told him that I was perfectly confident that I could. He then asked me if I wanted to go and try it, and I told him that that hundred dollars looked mighty good to me. He gave me permission to go, and I left on the next train for Thurber, and reached there as quickly as possible, and made a contract with Hunter to do the work which he had mapped out for me. I remained in the employ of the coal company eight months. One night, about twelve o'clock, I located thirteen anarchists in one bunch, hidden in a little dark corner, planning to dynamite the mine the following night. I had two men with me, and we crawled up close enough to hear every word that these anarchists said. When they had perfected their plans and stopped their discussion, we arrested the whole bunch and jailed them. A saloon was run at the mines by Tom Lawson, who had a ten-year lease on the building. Lawson also owned a fourth interest in the mine, but he and Colonel Hunter, the president, had a falling out for some cause, and Lawson got to standing in with the tough element. One night I heard a pistol shot in the saloon and ran in there to investigate, believing that somebody had been killed. When I reached the inside, I learned that Lawson, who was behind the bar drunk, had shot at a miner, but failed to hit him. This was on pay night, and everybody was full of beer and whiskey, and I had already filled the calaboose with drunken men. I decided to arrest Lawson and put him in with the other men, but when I advanced on him, he made a play for his six-shooter, 
but I fell squarely on top of him with my gun, removing enough skin from his head to half-sole a number tan shoe. He swore that he would not be locked up, but I put him in the calaboose all the same, and he was made to pay his fine as any other man. After paying his fine, Lawson left immediately to report me to Captain McMurray. Colonel Hunter saw Lawson in Fort Worth looking for McMurray and wired me about it, saying that he, Hunter, would stand between me and all danger. About two weeks after that, Captain McMurray came to Thurber and told me that he understood that I had knocked Lawson in the head and that he wanted to know the cause of it. I told him that Lawson was disturbing the peace and that he had shot at a miner, and when I tried to arrest him, he attempted to draw a gun on me and that I hit him with my six-shooter instead of shooting him with it. I disarmed him and put him in jail, I continued, and my captain replied that I ought to have broken his neck. About two months after that, Lawson and his bartender, Malcolm, and Colonel Hunter, all three met in a drugstore. Hunter and Lawson began cursing each other, and I heard the row and rushed into the store just in time to see Hunter burst the bottom of a spittoon out over Tom Lawson's head. Hunter then threw a box of cigars at him, striking Lawson in the ear and scattering cigars all over the floor. I noticed Malcolm slipping up behind Colonel Hunter, preparing to hit him in the back of the head. Just as he started to strike Hunter, however, I struck Malcolm myself, in time to stop what would have been a dreadful blow. Malcolm whirled around and saw that it was I who hit him. I struck him five times in the face, but he did nothing but back off the gallery. I struck him once again when he reached the outside and kicked him off the gallery. I thought I had him whipped, but when he got up he said he would fight me if I would put my six-shooter off. He was a stout man and weighed about 230 pounds, but I was not afraid of him. I removed my six-shooter and threw it over to Henry Cronk, the druggist, and told him to look out for it. I then pitched into Malcolm again, striking him in the face. He suddenly threw his big arm around my neck and pressed my head against his body. I could not get my head free without breaking my neck, and, having the advantage of me in that respect, he commenced beating my head, nose, and eyes until my face looked like jelly. I do not know what would have become of my face if Bob Ward, the company's lawyer, had not come to my rescue. Ward knocked Malcolm loose from me and knocked him twelve feet from where we were clinched. Tom Lawson then knocked Ward down, he falling on top of Malcolm. Hunter was pacing around after Lawson with a heavy rock, but never did get in his lick. When a carpenter, who was working nearby, saw the dangerous position that I was in when Malcolm had me clinched, he ran to my rescue with a hatchet in his hand. He was frightened and as pale as death, and he intended to cut Malcolm loose with his hatchet, but Ward got in ahead of him and did the work for him. My face was in a terrible fix, and the doctor put a beefsteak on it to draw the blood out of the bruised places. My face was so badly bruised and swollen that one could hardly tell where my eyes and nose were. I had a girl then, whom I was loving very dearly, and I could not go to see her for a long time on account of the sad condition of my complexion. I shunned her everywhere for quite a while, for I well knew that it would never do to let Betty see me in that fix. I went to the Justice of Peace the next morning after the fight and paid my fine, which amounted to $12. The money was paid back to me by Colonel Hunter. Hunter, Ward, Malcolm, and Lawson all fought their cases hard, but it cost them about $200 apiece before they were through, while the fight only cost me $12, and the money was refunded to me. Chapter 11 Water Spout at Canal. On the fourth day of June, 1891, one of the hardest rains that I ever experienced began falling in Canal at noon and lasted all the afternoon and throughout that night. I knew that the rain was going to do lots of damage if it kept up, so I resolved to go down to the railroad bridge before the northbound passenger train arrived to see if the dam was in good condition. I held my watch in my hand and when it was nearly time for the train to arrive, I walked down to the bridge where the passenger was to cross. I stood near the railroad tank until the train came in, but it was raining so hard that I could not see the smoke from the engine as the train came down the track. The passenger arrived on time and stopped on the east side of the tank to take water while I was on the west side examining the dam. I soon saw that the dam was giving way, so I waded into the tank and attracted the attention of the engineer. He could not hear what I was saying, so he left his engine and waited in the tank close enough to me to understand what I had to say. I told him that the dam was breaking, 
but he did not see any signs of it from where he was, and, thinking that I was unduly excited, he decided that I was mistaken, and, going back to his engine, he reversed the throttle and prepared to cross the bridge. About that time the dam broke and was swiftly washed away to the other side. The engineer stopped his engine just in time to save the train from going across the dam and being thrown overboard. Nearly 400 passengers, including many women and children, were on the train, and they seemed to be very grateful to me for the part that I played in saving their lives. The train crew were also thankful that they did not get any further than they did before the accident occurred. When the dam broke, the railroad bridges, the county bridge, two or three houses, and a number of windmills were all washed away. Several other rivers in that part of the state got on a rampage, and quite a number of county and railroad bridges, besides those around Kanawha, were destroyed. Chapter 12. Five People Beg for Food While doing duty as a policeman in the state capitol building in Austin in 1903, I boarded at the Capitol Hotel. One cold, rainy day I left the table, after eating my dinner, and discovered two ladies and three children standing at the screen door on the outside. I asked them what they wanted, and they said they had sent a little boy in there with a note asking for money enough to get dinner for all five of them. They said they were awful hungry. The little boy came out in a minute and said he had seen all those men in the dining room, but they would not give him a cent. The little fellow, who was about four years of age, had tears in his eyes and looked as if he was sentenced to his death. A baby boy had gone into the dining room, filled with men drawing their five dollars a day, and hadn't procured enough money to feed himself. His mother and the elder lady, who was about sixty-five years of age, said, well, I guess we'll have to go, but we are awful hungry. I told them to sit down in the sitting room, that I was going to see that they got something to eat. I saw the proprietor and got him to prepare a table for the five people. I then carried the poor people into the dining room and seated them around the table. I went to the waiters and told them to give those people something of everything they had and plenty of it. The waiters carefully and courteously attended to their wants, and the ladies and the children ate to their heart's content. I never felt happier in my life than I did when I watched them enjoy that meal. When they got through eating, they asked me if it would be any harm for them to carry the scraps away for their supper. Well, I told them that it was no harm at all, and I went to work at once and rustled up the biggest paper sack in the house for them, and told them to take everything they could find, which they did. After dinner, they went into the sitting room and sat around the stove to warm themselves and rest, as they were quite weary. They thanked me over and over for what I had done for them, and the old lady asked God to bless me for what she called my act of kindness, and asked him to bless all my efforts in life. The boys were too small to know what all this meant, and they sat on the floor, their hunger appeased, and laughed and played. This was a sad sight to me, and when the women began crying, I could not keep the tears from my own eyes. These unfortunate people were from the country, and bull weevils and other things had destroyed their crops for two years and left them destitute. They were in such a pitiful plight that I was thankful that I was able to aid them, and that dollar twenty-five that I gave for their dinner did me more good and furnished me more happiness than any other sum of money I ever spent. Chapter 13 The Murder of Hartman I was ordered by the governor in 1890 to go to San Saba as district court was to convene there and the presence of Texas Rangers in that town was greatly needed, for the people of that district were divided into two opposing factions and the bitterness that existed between them had become intense. Since 1880, San Saba had been the center of a disturbance caused by the organization of a mob whose operations extended into several other counties in that district. In other words, a number of people had banded together to protect themselves against the depredations of cattle thieves and other criminals who were numerous in that part of the state. A number of people lived in that district who had no regard for law and order and stole so many cattle, horses, and hogs that the people became harassed and decided to take the law into their own hands and punish the guilty parties as they saw fit, and for this reason the club, afterward referred to as the mob, was organized. The lawless element, of course, arrayed themselves against the mob faction. Many good people also lined up against it, as they did not believe in mob spirit and thought the law should be allowed to take its course. Thus a strong organization, called the anti-mob, grew into activity and bitterly opposed the other faction. 
The mob faction, however, was the stronger of the two sides in numbers and influence, and in San Saba County, their greatest stronghold, they elected one of their man sheriff. The mob did some good work for a while, but, like all organizations of that character, it finally went too far, and became more oppressive as it grew in power. Quite a number of bad citizens were slick enough to slip over to the stronger faction, uh, the mob element, and, as they did so, they played a big part in changing the purpose and power of that organization from good to bad. When the mob was first organized, it began to put down lawlessness, but in 1890, ten years later, the bitter feeling that existed between the mob and anti-mob factions had reached such a high pitch that there was much fighting and disorder. Lawlessness was encouraged by both sides and could not be prevented by local authorities. Killings became rather frequent occurrences, and thieves took advantage of the numerous opportunities and stole livestock without fear of prosecution. Thus the criminal docket was full of important cases, but the prosecuting attorney could not go about his work unless he was given protection by the state. So the governor sent me, as I have stated before, to San Saba to help them hold court. Red Murphy and Tom Platt, also rangers, were with me, and we arrived at San Saba on the following Sunday about noon. After eating dinner at the hotel, we walked up the street and found the town full of men, as court was to convene the next morning. The men were sitting or standing around in groups of twelve or fifteen, and were discussing with some fervor the convening of court. They had come to town to see that things were run to suit them when court opened, and they meant business for the stores were full of their guns and ammunition which they had brought with them. While passing one group, we heard a man inquire who we were, and another man replied that we were Texas Rangers, whereupon they all laughed, some of them remarking that if we ever got three miles out of town, we would never live to get back. We heard the remark, but paid no attention to it. On the following Tuesday night, someone came to the hotel where we were staying and asked the proprietor, Jim Darfmeyer, if the Texas Rangers were not staying with him. Darfmeyer told them that we were, and the visitor asked him to call us, which he did. When we got downstairs, we met Nat Hartman, whose home was on the Colorado River. He seemed very anxious about something, and informed us that his brother, Ed Hartman, was missing, and that he feared he had been killed. The Hartmans were members of the anti-mob faction, and Nat Hartman told us that this was the first time in nine years that his brother had been outside of his house after sundown. We told him that we would go by and get Sheriff Howard and commence looking for his brother. Nat objected to us getting Howard. We told him that we would have to have the sheriff with us, so we went by and called for Howard, who joined us in the search. We reached the home of Nat Hartman's father a little before day, and just before sunrise we left Hartman's house and started down the river, the way they claimed Ed went off the day before at one o'clock. We walked about three quarters of a mile and found the dead body of the man for whom we were searching, lying in the bed of the river. We traced two men's tracks from the body to a house, sixty steps away, where a Mr. Campbell, one of Howard's deputy sheriffs, lived. Campbell was out in the yard when he saw us coming, but he started in a fast walk to the house when he discovered us. We stopped him before he got very far, but he said something to his wife, who was standing in the doorway, and she whirled back into the building, returning in a second or two with something in her hand, which she held under her apron. We were satisfied that she had his six-shooter, and we ordered her not to go near her husband. She then went back into the house. We arrested Campbell and his two sons, Mech and Dave, and five other men in his neighborhood. We reached San Saba with them a little after dark that evening, and locked them up in the little house that Darfmeyer let us have for that night. We did not let them sleep together, and kept them from talking with each other, so that they would not make medicine. About an hour or two before day, Campbell asked me to let him get up and sit by the stove. I told him that would be all right, and he came over and began talking to me. He ran his hand over his face and said his face was pain in him. He also claimed that his mule pitched him off a day or two before that and threw him into a rough place, bruising his face up badly. He said he couldn't understand what was the matter with his mule, that he used to be a good mule, but had acted mighty strangely of late. He then claimed that the mule had also thrown one of his boys recently, and bruised his face up considerable. The next morning, we had all eight of the men up before the grand jury. Campbell testified before the grand jury that a little gray mare had fallen down with him in a rough place and bruised his face. 
Another man before the grand jury testified that a dun mare had fallen down with Campbell twelve miles further up the river. They made such conflicting statements in trying to get out of trouble that the grand jury indicted Dave Campbell and his father for the murder of Ed Hartman. Dave Campbell jumped his bond and was caught seven years later in Arizona, where he was living under the name of Alex Miller, and was brought back to San Saba, but he was acquitted. Old man Campbell got a change of venue to Fort Mason, and was convicted and sentenced to seven and a half years in the penitentiary, but appealed his case. He was tried sixteen times in eight years, and finally got off on a light sentence of two and a half years, and went to the penitentiary from Lampasas to serve it out. I had to go to court twice a year for eight years to testify in that case. Mr. Hartman, the father of the murdered man, is now dead, but he lived to fight the case for eight long years, and finally heard the sentence read to Campbell. In fighting the case, he spent every dollar he had, and sold his farm and home and stock in order to keep up the prosecution, and when he died at the age of seventy-seven years, he was renting land. He had remained faithful to his son to the last. Chapter 14. The Chase After Del Dean, When I Break My Arm and Ankle While court was in session at San Saba, Del Dean, an alleged horse thief, was notified that he had been indicted by the grand jury for stealing livestock. Dean at once mounted his horse and left town. Sheriff Hawkins asked me to capture Dean, saying that Dean had just left town, going out on the Lano Road. I mounted my horse and started out in pursuit. Riding fast, I soon came in sight of Dean, who was urging his horse to the utmost speed. I clamped spurs to my horse and commenced to gain still more on Dean, and for some time we kept up a hot race. It was mist and snow, and the weather was raw and cold. I was going downhill as fast as my horse could run, when he suddenly struck a flat table rock and let his feet slip from under him. He fell, and I was thrown twenty-three feet from the saddle. My horse was running so fast when he fell that it was remarkable that I was not killed. When my horse and I took that sudden stop, I fell into a pile of rocks, and my head was badly bruised, my face terribly lacerated, my right arm broken, and my ankle sprained. Dean, of course, made his escape, and I do not think that he saw my horse fall with me. I was badly crippled up, and was treated by doctors George and John Sanderson, brothers, for forty-six days. It was two years before I had any strength in my right hand and arm. I learned to shoot left-handed, and when my right arm got strong again, I could shoot as well with one hand as I could the other. Dean was captured by Edgar T. Nail after the latter became sheriff of San Saba County. When I went back to San Saba, I went to the jail and saw Dean. All the prisoners shook hands with me except Dean. He had turned out his beard, and I could not place him, so I asked him his name. He said, I am Dale Dean, the man whom you went pursuing when you broke your arm, and for that reason I thought probably you would not want to speak to me. I assured him that he was mistaken, that I had no ill feeling toward him at all. I told him that while it was my duty to pursue him, it was natural for him to try to escape, and that I did not blame him with the accident. I told him that I felt sorry for him because he was in jail, and hoped he would lead a better life when he got free again. Chapter 15. The Capture and Escape of Morris, the Noted Murderer In 1891, there lived in the little town of Vernon one Jim Morris and the two Moss brothers, who left together during that year for Greer County, where the three men were to take up land. The two Moss brothers had between them about five or six hundred dollars, which fact was known to Morris when the three left Vernon together. After reaching Salt Fork, which is in Greer County, they pitched camp to rest up a bit. While there, Morris and one of the Moss boys walked out a mile or so from the wagon to kill some game. After being gone a little while, Morris suddenly turned his gun on Moss and fired, killing him instantly. After burying the dead body in a sand hill, he went back to camp and told the other Moss boy that his brother had sent back for him and the wagon, as he had found a much better place to camp, and for him to hitch up and bring everything to the new stopping place. There happened to be two cowpunchers at the camp at this time who heard the conversation. Moss was sick, and when the two left, as Moss supposed, for the new camping place, he lay down in the bottom of the wagon, with his head near Morris, who was driving. Ignorant of the terrible fate that had just overtaken his brother a little while before, 
Moss unsuspectingly put his hat over his face so he could rest easier, with the sun's rays thus kept from his eyes. Morris took advantage of this opportunity and shot and killed the sick man, the bullet passing through his hat and blowing his brains out. He then threw the body out of the wagon and buried it in a nearby sand hill, exactly as he had disposed of the remains of the other man. Besides getting all of their money, he kept one of their watches, and also the coat which he took from his first victim. This coat had a bullet hole through the back, indicating the manner in which the man had been slain. Among other things found in the coat was a note which Moss had written to a young lady asking her for her company to church. The lady had accepted his invitation, according to this note, which had slipped into the lining through a worn-out pocket. When this murder occurred, I was stationed in Canna. At that time, there was no jail at Mangum, where we caught Morris, so we placed the prisoner in the calaboose. But as there was strong talk of lynching him, the officers removed him to Canna, where he was safely landed in the county jail. He was kept there about two years, and was closely guarded a greater part of that time by some of the rangers. He was tried on two indictments for murder, and was sentenced to hang in both cases. He appealed his case, however, and got a new trial, but the jury again brought in a verdict of death. He became very desperate, and was a hard man to keep imprisoned. One night during his trial, while being guarded by Bob Dawson, a constable of that county, he picked his shackles with a writing pan and broke away. In escaping, he jumped from a two-story window, and was at large three days and nights before he was recaptured and placed in jail. Morris kept us mighty busy before he was found, and when we did get him, we took him in a few days to Fort Worth for safekeeping, until the day of his execution but he succeeded in breaking away from that place also, and never has been captured nor located since. At the time of his escape, Morris was twenty-seven years of age, tall, broad-shouldered, and very handsome. One morning at sunrise, while in the break searching for Morris, we looked up the draw which led into Pease River and saw a fire. Thinking we would find our game, we at once surrounded the place where we saw the fire and smoke, but found instead an escaped convict. With him was a woman dressed in man's clothes. Her hair was cropped short, and on her heels she wore a pair of pet maker spurs. She also wore a California suit of clothes, a Stetson hat, a shop-made pair of boots, and a blue shirt and necktie. She was a Mistress Jenny Bates, and was stolen away from her home in Palo Pinto County by this convict. We took from her a forty-five Colts six-shooter, a Winchester, and a scabbard belt full of cartridges. The woman who weighed nearly 135 pounds, looked to be about 25 years of age and a little over 5 feet tall. With black hair and dark eyes, she appeared to be a good-looking man. The couple had stolen four head of horses, so we put them in jail at Canna. The convict had escaped from the penitentiary after serving five years of a ten-year sentence for horse-stealing. He was tried in Canna for his latest thefts and sent back to the penitentiary to finish serving his first sentence, with an addition of five years for his last crime. The woman got a change of venue from Canna to Vernon and came clear. The ladies of Vernon felt sorry for her and dressed her up in woman's clothing. Mrs. Wheeler was the only white woman I ever arrested. Mr. J. M. Britton, a ranger, aided in making the capture. Chapter 16. The Arrest of Hollingsworth I received a warrant from Austin in 1891 to arrest O. N. Hollingsworth. He was then living 18 miles west of Canna and 7 miles south of Kirkland. Pick Gibson, the sheriff, and Lon Lewis went with me after Mr. Hollingsworth. Hollingsworth knew Lon Lewis and Sheriff Gibson, but he had never seen me. So when we got within a half mile of Mr. Hollingsworth's house, they proposed that I go down to the house and see if he was there, saying that if he was, they would come on in a short time and for me to remain until they arrived there. They told me not to try to arrest him, for they were pretty well satisfied, since the old man's case was a bad one, that he would more than likely make a fight. When I rode up to the gate, I called out to the people, it being after dark, and a young man, who looked to be about seventeen years old, came out. I asked him if he had seen a man pass there riding a gray horse and leading a black, or riding a black and leading a gray. I told him that this man was about six feet two and one half inches tall, and had red curly hair and a heavy red mustache. I said that I wanted this man in Baylor County for the theft of these two horses. He said that he had not seen the man nor the horses. He asked me then to get down and spend the night with them. 
I told him that as my horse and I were very badly jaded, I would like to stay there that night. I asked him if I would be imposing on the family, and inquired if his father and mother were at home. He said that they were in the house, and I told them that I would stay. I led my horse up through the gate, and he remarked, Let's go and put your horse up. I told him that I would have to have a drink of water before I put my horse up, that I was nearly dying with thirst. The water barrel was sitting right in front of the door, and I could see it in the light. He insisted very much on me putting my horse up before I got the water, but I could see the old man standing in the door, and I was satisfied that he would step out in the dark and I would fail to see him that night, as the lot was on the other side, in the rear. I went on up to the front door and spoke to the old gentleman and took a drink of water. Then I asked the old gentleman if his name was Hollingsworth. He said it was. I said, I have papers for you, Mr. Hollingsworth. Where are they from? he asked. From Austin. Well, all right, he said. I turned my horse over to the young man and told him to hitch him. Then I stepped into the building, and the old gentleman and I sat down. Mrs. Hollingsworth was reading a book and never looked up nor spoke to me for twenty minutes, and when she did, she asked if I had been to supper. I told her that I had eaten some cheese and crackers that I had with me. She said, you had better let me go and fix something for you. I have plenty cooked. I insisted that she not put herself to any trouble, but she went anyway and fixed the table. I am satisfied that Mrs. Hollingsworth thought that I would leave her husband in the house while I went to eat. That would have given the old gentleman a chance to make his escape. So, when I started out, I told him to go out ahead of me. This little eating house was about twenty steps from the main building that we were in. I ate supper, and we went back to the dwelling and seated ourselves. The old gentleman commenced crying, and started to the bureau, where there was a double-barrel shotgun and a Winchester, one on each side. He was halfway to the bureau, when the thought struck me that he might make a bad play with those guns, being stirred up as he was and crying, so I halted him, and told him to come back and take his seat. He told me that he only wanted to get the hairbrush and brush his hair and beard, but I told him that he could do that in the morning. About that time Gibson and Lewis came up, and I was very glad to see them. I had been looking for them for some time for they told me that if I did not return they would come to me in a half hour, as they would know that he was at home, but it was all of an hour and a half before they came to me. They put their horses up, and Mrs. Hollingsworth began to fix beds for all of us. This building had only one room. It was cut back in a hill and planked up on each side and in front, making a comfortable house. Mrs. Hollingsworth made us a pallet in the front part of the building. She and her husband slept in the back, and there was a curtain in the center of the house that cut them off from the others. She told me that I could lie down and rest easy, that she would be responsible for her husband, that there was no way for him to escape. I noticed two windows in the back part of the building, so I told Mrs. Hollingsworth that I made it a point to guard all prisoners, and for her and her family to fix and lie down, and I would pull the curtains back so we could guard the old gentleman. It was seven miles from there to Kirkland, and eighteen miles from Kirkland to Canna, so we ate breakfast the next morning and got off in time to meet the southbound train at Kirkland. Mr. Hollingsworth's boy took him in the buggy to Kirkland. When we reached Kirkland, Pitt Gibson, the sheriff, took him to Canna on the train, and Lon Lewis and I rode through horseback. When Mr. Hollingsworth separated from his wife and two or three little girls, it was such a sad scene to witness that I never will forget it. His wife clung to his neck, and those sweet little girls held to his arms and legs. I thought I never would get away from the sound of his wife's and children's screams. This was, indeed, a sad morning to me, and the family had my deepest sympathy. When we reached Canna, I learned at our camp that Pitt Gibson had turned Mr. Hollingsworth over to the rangers, and he remained at our camp three days and nights before we sent him to Austin. While at camp, eating our grub, I asked the old gentleman one day if he would like to have a hotel dinner. He said he would so I took him to the Canna Hotel and gave him a good dinner. He asked me to walk upstairs with him, and he showed me some pictures of Jersey cows and calves which were hanging on the wall. They were beautiful, and he told me that his grown daughters had drawn them. He cried and said, Sullivan, I am no thief. My children overdrew on me. They were high livers, and they got me behind with the state. That is the reason you have me arrested. Hollinsworth was then about sixty-five years old, very straight and erect, and fine-looking, and was highly educated. I am satisfied that he was no thief, but his children were expensive in their way of living, 
and caused him to fall behind and make this great mistake with the state. When he got into this trouble, he was holding an office in Austin. Before that, he taught school and bore a good name. He gave bond in Austin, but jumped it and made his escape. His wife sold her home, and his two daughters sold theirs, a section of land apiece, and paid the bond off. I have never heard of Hollinsworth since. Chapter 17 The Capture of Mays, the Noted Horse Thief While stationed at Canna, Texas, I was notified one evening by Colonel Rush that Doc James, alias Doc Mays, a noted horse thief, was camping near Canna, and that he was stealing cattle and horses throughout that part of the country. Colonel Rush had just arrived in Canna on the train from Colorado City. He told me that he had two herds of cattle near Canna that had been driven in from Colorado City by his hands. As Mays was wanted in seven counties, I thought I had better make good work of him, so I took Frank Hofer, a ranger, and Bob Collier, a deputy sheriff, and started after this cattle thief. I at once went north with them to Grosbeck River, about five miles out of town, where I found a herd of cattle. I asked the man who had charge of the cattle if that herd belonged to Colonel Rush. He replied that they did not, that Rush's herd was south of the Fort Worth and Denver Road, so I bade him goodbye and started south. When I got to the railroad, I met two ladies in a buggy going west up the track. I looked around, and about five miles south of the track I saw the herd, but I was satisfied that these ladies were going up the track to another herd, and, thinking that the cattle west of us were Rush's, I pled with Bob Collier to go with me, and we would follow the ladies. I was afraid that the ladies would inform Mays that the officers were around, and told Bob that that was why I wanted to go up the track then. But Bob was hard-headed and would not go with us, so we turned and ran our horses to the herd that was directly south of us, and made the five miles in a little while. When I reached the herd, I saw a man sitting on a big black horse. I asked him if this was Colonel Rush's herd, and he said, No, Rush's herd is at Canna, at the railroad tank watering. I knew that was a lie for I had not been away from Canna more than three-quarters of an hour, as I had been riding fast all the time. I rode around the herd and asked one of the hands, a Mexican, if he could tell me where either one of Colonel Rush's herds was. In reply, he pointed west, the direction in which the two ladies were going, and said, Yonder is the herd on that high divide about five miles from here. Then I was somewhat vexed, when I remembered that Bob would not consent to us following the buggy a little while before. Although our horses were hot and tired, I told Bob and Frank to put theirs beside mine, and we would run them over to the other herd. I told Bob that since he had acted such a fool and caused this trouble, I would make him kill that horse of his, so we laid the steel to our horses and pulled for that other five-mile heat. We had arrived within three-quarters of a mile from May's camp, and the herders had failed to see us, as we were in a flat covered with mesquite timber, and they were at the top of a hill right on the divide. The two ladies, whom we had seen going up the track, had reported to them that we were coming. A man, calling himself Jackson, was sent at once to the wagon at their camp to inform Mays that we were coming, but he did not get to deliver his message. As we were nearing the divide, Jackson ran his horse into us at full speed. I stopped him and asked him where he was going. He replied that he was going to camp to change horses. I told him that his horse didn't seem to be very tired from the way he was moving out. I then put him under arrest and told him to tell me the truth. I want a fellow, I said, by the name of Doc James, alias Doc Mays, and don't you tell me anything but the truth. Is he with the herd, or is he at camp? He replied that he was at the camp. I asked him how far it was to the camp. He said it was about a mile and a half. I then told him to put his horse beside mine and take me the nearest way to camp. When I got within 800 yards of their camp, I saw the same man who I had met sitting on the black horse at the other herd five miles away. He was the one who had told me such a story about Bush's cattle being in Canna, watering at the railroad tank. He also had a message to deliver to Mays about us, and had run his horse fast enough to beat us a minute or two, but too late to give Mays sufficient time to get away. We saw him rush up to the wagon and tell Mays that we were coming. Mays sprang up and, in a stooping position, went in a trot to his saddle, about thirty yards away, and pulled his Winchester out of the scabbard. The man on the black horse immediately put spurs to his steed and left for his herd. When I saw Mays making for his Winchester, I thought I could rush in and get him before he reached it. I had no more use for Jackson, so I told Bob and Frank, both, 
to follow me and let him go. I then spurred my horse up and went straight for Mays, with Bob following me. Bob, however, had told Frank to stay behind and guard Jackson, which was not my wish, and Frank did what Bob had requested him to do. Bob stayed with me about 300 yards, and then dropped behind, and when I had gotten within 200 yards of Mays, I heard him, Bob, yelling at me to hold up. I had gone too far by this time to turn back, so I paid no attention to Bob, but kept jerking cat hair out of my horse's sides. When I had gotten within 60 yards of the wagon, Mays yelled to me that he would kill me if I crowded him any more. About that time my horse became frightened at some blankets hanging out on a mesquite bush and commenced jumping a thousand ways a second, but I kept pulling for the wagon. Mays had gotten behind the wagon and was at this time sitting by the wheels with his Winchester at his shoulder. When I saw him and remembered his reputation as a fine shot and a dangerous man, I said to myself, I am a dead man. I jumped my horse over the wagon tongue, which placed me within six feet of Mays. I sat my horse down and pointed my gun at Mays and told him to surrender. He said he would. I ordered him to throw his Winchester on the ground, which he did. I searched him for his six-shooter and picked his Winchester up. About that time, Bob Collier, the deputy sheriff, came up. Mays asked me why I crowded him as I did. If I had had my Winchester loaded, he said, you would have been in hell right now. This is the first time in fourteen years that the magazine of my rifle has ever been empty. I asked him how it came to be empty then. He replied that one of the boys had gone out to shoot rabbits a little while before that and emptied the magazine and had forgotten to reload it. Then I asked him if his name was Mays, and he replied that it was. I asked him if James would not suit him better, but he only smiled. I then asked him if he had a horse. He replied that he had a little old soreback cow pony. About that time Frank Hofer came up, bringing Jackson with him. I scolded Frank a little bit about staying with Jackson instead of coming with me as I had requested him to. I told Jackson to go with Frank and get May's horse, which he did, returning in a few minutes. I found that May's had lied. His little soreback cow pony was a thoroughbred racehorse and as pretty as a peach. I handcuffed Mays and took his bridle reins. Then I tied a rope around his animal's neck and wrapped the other end around the horn of my saddle and let Mays mount his horse. After we started off, Mays asked me to let him have the reins as his horse traveled so badly when he did not have reins in his hands. I had a suspicion that he intended to attempt to make his escape, so I did not grant his request. I put him in the county jail at Canna. He was wanted at Weatherford for horse theft. He was sentenced to the penitentiary for nine years, was tried again in Colorado City, and sentenced for an additional nine years. He was wanted in five more counties, but did not answer for the other charges. After serving six years of his term of nine years, he was pardoned out of the penitentiary by Governor Culberson. End chapters 10 through 17